Okay, we'd like to get started. Welcome to the Mercatus Lunch Lecture Series. I'd just like to take a quick minute to introduce our speaker, Professor Hilton Root. Um, Hilton Root is an academic and a policy specialist in the international political economy and development. He joined the George Mason University School of Public Policy in 2006 and joined the Mercatus Center as an affiliated scholar in 2007. Dr. Root was a Freeman Professor of Economics at Pitzer College and Senior Fellow at Claremont Graduate University from 2003 to June 2006. He served the current administration as U.S. Executive Director Designate of the Asian Development Bank and as Senior Advisor on Development Finance to the Department of the Treasury. Dr. Root was Director and Senior Fellow of Global Studies at the Milken Institute and was a Senior Research Fellow and Director of the Initiative on Economic Growth at Democracy at the Hoover Institute. As an academic, he has taught at the University of Michigan, California Institute of Technology, the University of Pennsylvania, and Stanford University. Professor Root has lectured and written extensively, publishing seven books and over a hundred articles. As a policy expert, Professor Root advises the Asian Development Bank, the IMF, the World Bank, the UNDP, the OECD, the U.S. State Department, and the U.S. Treasury Department, and USAID. He has completed projects in over 23 countries. We are very excited to hear his lecture today based on his forthcoming book, so please help me in welcoming Dr. Hilton Root. Yeah, I have for the title of this new book, which I will be briefly outlining for you today. And uh, I've already heard from some members of the audience that this title doesn't do justice to the book. Uh, and I, I probably can agree with that. So if you have any ideas uh, or criticism of the title, that's very valuable at this point. Uh, having said that, what I've done in preparation for today's event is. Um, Outline what I think are the grand themes of the book that I've been working on uh, for over a year, but that I've been thinking about for, for more than 20 years, which is how to uh, incorporate ideas from the science of complexity into global political economy. Um, I, I'm going to start by presenting what I think are the implications. Of my, of my argument, and then I will actually go through the argument with you. Um, this argument is, stands in very sharp contrast to uh, the view of global history uh, articulated in Francis Fukuyama's The End of History, which I think is the paradigmatic statement of how uh, policymakers after 1992 viewed the world. Uh, essentially, having won the, the Second World War and the Cold War, the liberal market democracies of the West found themselves in a position where they could act as system administrators and essentially determine the rules of the game by which other countries would have to play. Um, a very stark indication of that was um, the United States' refusal to stay in the United Nations should China be admitted in 1960, which was effective. Uh, and today, uh, if you think about uh, the U.S.'s ability to take that kind of position and, and actually win over others, you can see that, that the power, persuasion, and influence of the United States uh, has significantly waned. Uh, having said that, Essentially, the winners of these two major uh, conflicts of the, of the second half of the 20th century could define legitimacy. They could also define the effect of state, because economic success had bestowed another system defining role on the West, which was that it could uh, impose its concept of an effective state on less effective states, uh, and this was particularly manifest in the structural reforms imposed by international financial institutions, uh, the so-called Washington Consensus of the 1980s and 
1990s, which, which in effect reflects the uh, authority that the West had uh, in basically trying to persuade or being able to persuade other countries to make reforms that were modeled after reforms that were being undertaken uh, in, in England you know, and the United States, essentially the trimming of, of the welfare state and, and the regulatory functions of the state having those trimmed back. Uh, among the uh, most important pillars uh, of the new order, which I call liberal internationalism, and this is not a term that I've invented, this is a term that is actually uh, developed by the European Union, and, and it's a term that has very precise definitions, and they clearly monitor uh, the progress of internationalism, uh, liberal internationalism, various uh, international organizations by monitoring the, the, the swing votes uh, towards liberal international positions. And, uh, and I'll explain that later. But this uh, ethos or, or set of principles essentially became the principles of the system itself after, in my judgment, the aborted attempt of former colonialism of uh, France and England to uh, regain control of the Suez Canal, uh, and after the United States refused to support the British, the British understood that, that henceforward they were no longer going to determine the uh, ethos of the world order, and, and, that, and that without the support of the United States, uh, they would not be able to accomplish much of anything. I think the French certainly came to that conclusion, although with more reluctance. So what does liberal internationalism mean? Uh, it means fostering democracy and human rights, an open economy, promotion of multilateralism, and strengthening of uh, regimes of international law and organization. Now, what's interesting, and Europeans bring this out all the time, is that although these concepts were most directly advocated initially by the United States, today it's the European Union, and not the United States, that most clearly uh, embodies these principles. Uh, the European Union votes in international organizations according to these principles with much, much greater consistency than the United States does. The uh, middle class of countries, uh, that is, those countries in the middle that would be rising, were viewed in, in the philosophy of liberal internationalism as the pillars of the system. And the middle class within countries would be the uh, stabilizing factor uh, within 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 populations. Uh, and this this theory of the importance of the rising middle is, is very characteristic of, of both literature and historical sociology uh, and literature uh, in international relations. Uh, what's interesting is that it's been completely refuted. Uh, in historical literature. So, for example, people who studied this thesis about the so-called rising middle classes going back to the 16th century when the rising middle classes were supposed to be responsible for the Reformation and the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution, the Progressive Revolution, and uh, uh, there's, no, there's, no, there's, no, there's no longer any, uh, there are no longer historians who believe in this. Uh, but nevertheless, people who study uh, what was it? Policymakers tended to rest their belief that uh, if you can create a middle class in a country, for example, like China or Russia, it would lead those countries into some kind of a liberal international position. And so, even uh, as, as a year or two ago, when Condoleezza Rice was the Secretary of State, she would always be talking about the growing middle classes in China uh, and how the expansion of middle class in China was essentially. Help establish a uh, liberal international perspective among the Chinese elite. Uh, to say the same thing across the Clinton administration forces the same belief with regard to his policies in Russia. Um, <coughs> people who know these countries very well uh, don't, don't, don't see any, any don't find that these be very persuasive arguments. But there's even a deeper problem, whether it's true or not. The uh, economic trends of the last 20 years have not produced uh, a global bill. Uh, in fact, instead of global citizenship, 
there is increasingly world inequality, uh, that is inequality between countries and within countries. So, so although that's very hard to measure, if you were to uh, use any of the measurements you have, you don't see the strengthening of the middle, you actually see the weakening of the middle. <coughs> and that's why uh, people like uh, Bursell, uh Nancy Bursell and uh, uh, Davis uh, developed economists has started to advocate that U.S. foreign policy can emphasize creating middle class developing across the world, such as uh, Latin America. Well, it should be clear from recent events that there are many risks uh, that were not foreseen by the liberal international vision, uh, and, 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 many, and some of these risks have system destabilizing effects. Um, and I'll talk about these both in terms of the legitimacy argument and the effectiveness argument. Uh, I see that I haven't been cooperating for many years, so I should <coughs> take it alone. Uh, so, of the um, of the arguments that I've mentioned, one trend that that I that, that refutes. Uh, is that many countries uh, which have made the most economic and social progress under the new rules of the game, I mean by the new rules of the game, the rules of openness that have been negotiated since the 1960s, uh, they are not necessarily examples of bureaucratic accountability, and they're not necessarily examples of open markets. Uh, in fact, the liberal regimes have more, uh, have more effectively, in the last 20 years, positioned their population benefit from global trade and global openness than have uh, democratic regimes. Uh, and this is this is deeply problematic. Uh, and, and if you look at uh, political uh, studies of, of, of political uh, transition, uh, you see that probably the, the most important issue in people studying transition is the fact that democratic transitions in the third world uh, have not produced the effects that um, we have expected that we would have expected if we view those transitions from the mirror of Western Europe when the rise of the extension of suffrage led to the rise of let's say the welfare state uh, and led to the social protection of a large group of population. So if you look at the democracies that have formed since 1980, uh, they haven't provided a similar level of social protection. Uh, so with emerging democracies not having positive effects in terms of enhancing the welfare population, whereas non-liberal regimes have had more success in attracting international investment and greater economic prosperity, uh, and of course, greater social, much better social uh, indicators. Of course, a lot of this is due to the rise of China. But what this all does is that it, 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 it vitiates the, uh, the legitimacy argument uh, and the effective state argument upon which the liberal international uh, position is grounded. Then we have another factor, which uh, my colleague Jack Olson presented in the group only a few months ago, and now is presenting. Many venues around the, around the world, actually. Global megatrends, particularly population growth, demographic trends, uh, and trade imbalances are strengthening illiberal regimes <coughs> relative to the liberal West. And, and most notably, they're, li- they're, they're, they're um, precipitating alliance formation uh, among uh, non liberal regimes. And there are two blocks that have formed. That essentially, in the last two years, are beginning to consolidate very clearly. One is the Islamic bloc. This is comprised of countries that are, that are Islamic. And in their international organizations, increasingly, they vote together. And another bloc is what is known as the Axis of Sovereignty. These are authoritarians led by China, which include countries, uh, Zimbabwe, Sudan, Burma, North Korea. We can also say that this bloc, uh, is the bloc of Variety regimes, but that would not be true. Uh, this block is increasingly pulling in 
countries that previously were in the middle and that had liberal uh, antecedents, such as Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka is a very interesting case, uh, and I will spend a minute or two talking about it. Sri Lanka was a, was a country that had a very strong uh, Anglo uh, constitutional framework, uh, a very strong parliamentary regime was established. Uh, it also had a presumably larger middle class than any developing country, and it was expected to be among the superstars in the developing world. At extremely high literacy in 1948, even in the country. Uh, but in the last five to ten years, uh, especially in the last five years, Sri Lanka has increasingly uh, fallen into the China block. Uh, and the reason being that, that China has provided Sri Lanka with the weapons and the ideological cover to undertake uh, a, a very inhumane uh, uh, assault on Tamil rebel in the northern part of the country, something that the Europeans and the United States both censored. Uh, and what was very interesting is that despite uh, gross allegations, allegations of human rights and condemnation by the United Nations, um, by the liberal internationalist countries, the, um, the Axis Sovereignty Group was able to accord President of Sri Lanka with accolades for having annihilated the opposition, having actually murdered at least 10,000 people, uh, along with the uh, combatants uh, from the Tamil Tigers. And, and what was very interesting is that the Chinese provided uh, Sri Lanka with major investments. Infrastructure, including construction of a port, roads, and uh, uh, an airport. And Iran, which by the way is a member of both blocks, gave Sri Lanka $1.9 billion in credits uh, so that it could have all the oil based on the you don't have to pay for it. Uh, and, and China. The amount of money that China had given Sri Lanka was not actually in the Sri Lankan budget. Uh, and so it allowed the president to uh, create a cabinet of 150 people uh, out of 250 parliamentary members. Uh, and in effect, he is the uh, minister of 70 of those, uh, he's taken over 70 of those cabinet positions and has assigned his brother control, uh, his four brothers control or others. So basically what you have is with Chinese resources in a country that was traditionally a westernized country, you now have a, a dynasty of a family. Uh, and in, in, in about three weeks ago, the president of Sri Lanka uh, changed the constitution so he could be a president for life. So uh, it is probable and it is expected that the acts of sovereignty will become the dominant bloc in the United Nations and in the WTO within the next few years. Because essentially, China and Iran are able to bestow money on countries in exchange for oil. It's something that we told them how to do, but they now have the money and we don't. And, and so, there's a very clear shift uh, in global voting, uh, which more or less makes Institutions that were traditionally used to promote federal international because of the United Nations and WTO, uh, useless. Useless for the purposes that they were originally created for. Uh, and this is why many people who are aware of these trends, such as, uh, Robert Keegan, who we're familiar with, advocate that we form a concert of democracy and, and, and basically use that format to Kind of basin of attraction, kind of veil against uh, the Chinese control over the, over the United Nations. Uh, now, the reason the Chinese are able to control the United Nations, or will be able to, is that their influence in Africa. There are 50 African countries, 
increasingly these countries are now heavily dependent on Chinese investment and Chinese loans. Um, I'd say one other thing about these loans is that since the conditions under which these loans are unfamiliar to the common elements of these countries, the population of these countries, there's no do public documentation for any of them. Uh, we don't know what the terms of the loans are, but we have good reason to believe that these terms are extremely onerous. So that what will happen when these countries cannot repay these loans is that they will become increasingly subjected to political pressure by, by the Chinese, just as the British are able to influence voting in Latin America, or politics in Latin America during the 19th century through the loans that they had made in countries like Brazil and Argentina. Uh, so what I'm saying is that China is not doing anything particularly unfamiliar. It's just that they now have the resources to do things. Western powers have traditionally done very effectively. So, one of the points, uh, one of one of the aspects of these uh, this, these two new power blocks in the world that are emerging is that they are basically uh, rally around collective values. Uh, they 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 do not believe in the individual rights based values of uh, the international divorce consensus. Now, if we look at uh, the democratic transitions in countries like Nigeria, Turkey, and Iran, again, we do not see the uh, system preserving properties of democracy that were hoped for in the liberal uh, thesis. Uh, instead, we see that these countries have become relatively stable democracies, but as they are increasingly weak, described in literature and political science, they're really becoming, uh, they're, they're like uh, competitive uh, autocracy. In other words, one party basically dominates these, these regimes. They're not particularly effective at economic performance. They don't particularly uh, strongly uh, advocate civic humanism or, or, or carry it out. And they don't spread economic opportunity among their population. So they don't do any of the things that we attribute to democratic transition, or at least that we attribute to democratic transition that occurred in Europe uh, with the extension of suffrage. Now, of course, in the book I get into reasons why I think this contrast, this divergence in outcome uh, occurs. And one of them has to do with the fact that almost all of the major Extensions of suffrage were accompanied by what people call the audit of war. They occurred in a environment of conflict in which increasingly large groups of uh, subsectors of the population uh, were used in, in, in combat and were rewarded with rights, social rights at the end of war, uh, at the end of major wars. Uh, and that process complemented the intention of suffering had not been replicated in the third world today, or at least in those major developing countries uh, in the third world, where the major populations are like the Philippines, like Indonesia, like Pakistan, and like uh, Pakistan might be a, a bit of an outlier uh, in Egypt. So, um, as a result of these trends, all of the trends, the above trends that I mentioned, um, the status of the liberal West as system administrator uh, and its ability to determine the paradigm of legitimate order for other countries to follow, all of that is breaking down. Uh, and so the liberal West is no longer in most international venues able to assert either its, its, its definition of effective states or to define regime legitimacy in its own image as it was once able to do. So, um, there are many, many, many examples of these patterns, uh, but they raise some very uh, important questions. Uh, and one of the, and I'll, I'll list some of these questions. I'm not going to actually answer them. I'm going to suggest to you later how one might approach these questions. First of these questions is, considering the rise of modernizing authoritarianism, uh, can we 
determine whether it will sustain enough of the systems, and when I say system, I mean the literal international system, the key attributes of the system to maintain the system-wide identity, even as the constituent parts change, and even as the uh, environment changes. Secondly, can the global system maintain the identity as acquired through the Cold War and the post-Cold War period, despite the changes in its component uh, parts? Uh, can a broader legitimacy be created without a calamitous event such as a Great War? All of the uh, legitimacy-defining events or transitions in, in, in the world history that we, that, that we know of occurred as a result, usually of climate, usually of major uh, conflicts. So, if you look at the, the rise of the dynastic state, uh, which replaced the feudal state, if you look at the, the state, uh, the, the state, uh, the Polyonic state, and the influence that, that arose due to the war and the, the outcome of conflict. Uh, if you look at the rise of the modern state, it resulted from Adaptations of, of the European power to Napoleon. Uh, and so, and of course, the liberal internationalist concept of the state uh, was really a product of both the first and, and, and certainly the defining uh, uh, event was the, the, the success of Western democracy in the New England Second World War. So, we need to start asking ourselves what rules for global cooperation are needed to prevent new centers of cultural and geographic affinity from overwhelming the adaptive capacity of the system, pushing it into a transition of unforeseen consequences. And where will this new template for legitimacy come from? Uh, will it come from existing institutions like the United Nations? Will it come uh, as a result of the coalitional dynamics uh, that I described with regard to the act of sovereignty, or the emergence of an Islamic bloc, uh, or the consolidation of those two. Uh, so, how does one, uh, maybe I should say, before we get into uh, this question of the internet dynamics of the system, how to understand it, let me just give you uh, a certain uh, perspective on on what's really being questioned here, uh, on what's really being um, uh, fought over. What are the competing truths between the two camps? And if you just look at one issue alone, which is the concept of economic development, uh, in the most general terms, this is an aspiration that is widely accepted by all governments people. Uh, yet the new, uh, what I call attractors in the system, have their own way to link democracy and economic development with the goal of international cooperation. And they do this in a very interesting way. They divide economic development into three discrete objectives. So the first one is the eradication of poverty. Now the eradication of poverty is something we all value, and of course if you walk by uh, the World Bank, you see that uh, the dream is a world without poverty, and the Asian Development Bank has the same dream. And this dream obviously uh, has universal support. Uh, but China is the country in the world that that, not, uh, that has uh, done more than any other country to uh, radically transform its political economy for the benefit of the working majority. In other words, the countries that have followed the liberal democratic uh, line have not done as well in eliminating poverty uh, as the Chinese have done. Uh, just looking at the question of longevity, which increased in China, that li 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 average life expectancy in 1949 was 42 years. Today it is uh, 76 years. So if you look at the countries that, that have followed the democratic path, none of them have as dramatically Transform basic social indicators. Um, now, the second issue uh, would be the reduction of domestic inequalities. Um, 
here you have a real conflict for developing countries because uh, all of the upwardly mobile states, such as Brazil, China, and India, face a dramatic process of polarization uh, caused by rising inequality. Uh, so there's a trade-off in public policy between those policies that foster equality and growth, and these countries you know, ultimately have to choose uh, policies that will either accelerate uh, inequality uh, or accelerate growth. And so if you were India, for example, you might choose to accelerate growth because inequality is not as severe as it is increasingly becoming in China. Anyway, this is the choice these countries face. Now, the goal number three is really the dividing one, the one where there is conflict. And that is, for Brazil, China, and India, these are regimes of extremely divergent uh, structures, uh, the leveling of global power disparities is the real meaning of constant economic development. In other words, this is where you have a system preser preserving policies of the incumbents clashing with the views of the rising powers, because the rising powers, powers almost all attribute a higher value to uh, closing the inequality between countries, and they put more value on that than closing the gap between uh, the rich and the poor in their own country. Uh, and, and, that, and that's a fundamentally important uh, distinction. Now, another very important distinction is actually the definition of growth and the role of uh, technology. In most of the literature that we read on economic development, uh, growth is viewed in terms of intensive growth. In other words, technologically driven growth, in which the productivity driven by technological innovation is really the driving factor. Um, but if you look at the concepts of growth of countries like Iran, uh, China, and Russia in particular, their concept goes back to uh, something that Esther Bostrom used to talk about in the 1980s, which is uh, extensive growth. She made this distinction between extensive growth and, and, and intensive growth. And extensive growth is obtained by territorial expansion, clearing of fields, for example, discovering new resources like oil, or, uh, or, or seizing territories, or subjugating uh, neighboring populations. In other words, extensive growth is essentially Malthusian, where intensive growth is essentially a, a non-zero sum, I mean, uh, outcome. Uh, now, if you live in an extensive, uh, if you view the world in terms of extensive growth, uh, then you're going to be thinking of economic development in terms of gains from predation, not necessarily increasing returns at scale. Uh, you're going to be thinking of growth in terms of rent seeking rather than productivity growth. You're going to be thinking of growth in terms of, 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 of some nations winning and some other nations losing. And, and this is precisely how uh, growth is thought of in East Asia. So, for example, when, when, when China looks at uh, when, when, uh, China looks to Japan as a model, which is much more likely to do than it is to look at the United States, what they see is that China was able, to, that Japan was able to bend the rules of capitalism to achieve national wealth. Uh, and this is what attracts them. In other words, it's not the technology side, it's the extensive growth side of China's development, of East Asia's development, the mercantile side that China uh, sees as attractive uh, in terms of its concept of globalization. So our view is, well, we will um, we will lead China towards democracy through globalization or through exposing it to open markets. The Chinese view is that um, we will be forced to engage China uh, and desist from hegemonic uh, demands as a result of globalization, uh, and so they are much more interested, for example, in what we would, what I would call a promiscuous diffusion of technology. And what does this mean exactly? Well, what this means is that um, China has adopted a, a, a model of economic development, which is really quite different from the model of China in the 1980s, when we first saw a rising private sector in China, uh, and, and we, we presume that when the state-led industries 
diminished that, that they would be replaced by a private sector, a privately owned company. We no longer see this in China. Uh, the, the, the private sector in China is actually diminishing, and the state government sector, sector is privileged by having you know, almost exclusive access to the major sources of capital in China from state owned banks. So what, what's really happening in China is the use and the successful use of international markets to obtain uh, political power to be used for both international and domestic purposes. Uh, and so there's a technological dimension to this, which is that as China becomes capable of targeting industries through uh, targeting credit, they are actually uh, able to lower the uh, gains to innovation through private investment. Uh, and this has very, very dramatic consequences for uh, firms, private, private investment firms. For example, General Motors uh, traditionally wanted to develop a new engine to, to, to invest in that engine itself. But today, General Motors' view is, since any engine that we produce today is going to be copied by China within two to three years, we will not be able to gain back the uh, investment level, so they come to the U.S. government and they ask for subsidies. Uh, and so increasingly, U.S. firms, of course, they can't control the international property rights to their uh, innovations. They can't really justify their, their investment levels. So investment levels are actually going down. Uh, and, and increasingly, firms in the United States turn to the government and say, the only way we can compete in a world where we can't protect our intellectual property is to... Um, is, is, to, is to demand subsidy from the government. Um, so what does this mean? Well, this potentially means that as we go forward, we will see the pace of technological innovation actually diminish because of the fusion that doesn't respect the ownership uh, rights or the investment rights uh, of, of private investment. And it also means that privately invested companies uh, are going to be increasingly less able to handle the major, uh, uh, the major technology investment, uh, the major, uh, the major large scale investment. So, for example, a lot of you think about the evils that have occurred from uh, British Petroleum and so called mismanagement uh, of, of the events here in the Gulf. But the implication of this their failure to, to succeed at this is that next time around, they won't have the money to do this. That the only companies that will really be able to undertake major export, export, exploratory activities of, on a scale will be Russian or Chinese companies that don't have to concern themselves with the bottom line. So, so that as, as the, uh, as, as the private the profits do, Private investment are driven down for a lot of reasons, not only the kind of competition, but also because of the environmental standards or other standards that, that are imposed on these companies, their ability to compete internationally, and their ability to, to be the large players in the international economy will diminish. So there's another interesting dynamic, which is a co evolutionary dynamic that's going on, so that instead of the West leading China towards a more liberal international perspective, uh, there's actually the reverse is occurring. There's a, 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 a evolutionary dynamic in the sense that uh, increasingly countries have to recognize the, uh, the demands uh, of, 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 of the Chinese. Uh, they, they want to provide many, many, uh, many, many uh, examples of this. And, and so increasingly, China's system which we thought would be transformed by introducing it to an open market environment, is actually having a system of shaping impact. Uh, and this impact is most clearly observable, as I said, in South Asia, where it now more or less controls the outcome uh, of what's happening in Afghanistan. Uh, many of you may not be aware of the belief, I just came back from the region, that the growth of Kabul uh, starts in Beijing. Uh, and and, uh, but it is clearly understood that Pakistan's willingness to be an ally of the United States really depends ultimately 
on, on China's position, because China is a provisioner of nuclear technology that the Chinese, that the Pakistan military depends on. Uh, and so, even in, 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 even uh, an outcome uh, such as the uh, as what's going on in Afghanistan will be determined uh, in Beijing. This is what people now are increasingly talking about the Beijing consensus. Uh, and I gave you the example of Sri Lanka, a country that was clearly in the global middle and is now, you know, decisively in the China fold, uh, and will remain so, uh, so long as this president, uh, is there. And I was actually in Sri Lanka, uh, about six months ago, and I asked, uh, people there. I was actually told by the finance minister of Sri Lanka, and I gave a big talk there on, on um, financial markets and technology. Um, he brought me up to his office, and he said, you know, I've got two billion dollars from China, I've got 1.9 billion dollars from Iran, and I've got 100 million dollars from the United States. Uh, and, and, and he said, well, quite frankly, you guys are no longer in the game. I mean, you know, we have nothing against you, but what are you putting up? A uh, hundred million dollars didn't buy you a lot of influence in a country like New York. And so my response was, uh, why do you want to play that game? Why don't you want to play a game of Sri Lanka can be a country that has its own economic dynamics generated by, you know, a vibrant investor environment and, you know, from this and the international economy and all this blah blah, blah stuff that we can tell them about. And he said, you know, that's what it was to them, just uh, blah blah. They you know, got four billion dollars now uh, in, the, uh, in the president's pocket. They're no longer talking about this money that is given, or more or less a blind check, to the president of the country. And as I said, when with that money, he was able to buy the loyalty of the majority of the, uh, the parliament and was able to win the election with 60%, first time anyone had a majority in Sri Lanka's uh, parliamentary history, and he was able to annul the constitution and, and allow uh, himself to be uh, president of the life uh, and the family. It's not just him, it's his family, because as I said, it's, uh, those governmental functions that he doesn't directly oversee are now assigned to his four brothers. And I also mentioned to you that the Chinese are building a fourth major international airport in Sri Lanka. I didn't tell you that they're building this in his hometown, uh, in his home province. Uh, and so he's going to make his hometown, which was a tiny village of 10,000 people, eventually into the capital of the country with Chinese money. Uh, so so th that's the scale of China's influence uh, in, in the possible world that we're traditionally viewed as uh, more or less of the Western alliance. And so it's quite interesting that the Western countries, uh, particularly the United States and Britain, believe that by censoring Sri Lanka, that we were going to hurt their feelings enough to then shame them into changing their course of action. Uh, and in fact, the reverse has happened. Uh, and I just got back, as I said, from Pakistan, and in all of the newspapers, what you would read is uh, Pakistan's real ally is China. The United States is fickle, they won't give us a fixed sum of money, they want conditions, China gives us a blank check, they give us a nuclear technology, they just will support, uh, they, we know that they're our friends, they've never once censored us, they've never told us how to play our internal game in the United States and say, well, we'll give you two billion dollars, but we'll shame you first and humiliate you, we'll talk about, you know, all of these abuses. And, and so, increasingly, uh, the influence that China is able to, to, to yield, uh, and its ability to define legitimacy, which is really ultimately what's at stake here, uh, has, has been altered. Uh, so in fact, there are many, many global risks that were unforeseen by liberalism, uh, and some of these even are risks from global integration that we thought was the panacea, and it turned out uh, that this wasn't the case. Um, now I'll make one other point, which is that increasingly 
is not necessarily a good thing for all developing countries. What this means is you're going to have regional hegemons. You're going to have Brazil. You're going to have to a certain extent India, though India's kind of out of the game right now. You're going to have China. You're going to have Iran. They're going to be able to dictate the conditions in their immediate surroundings, uh, and and to their own benefit. So that even a country like Japan, which we traditionally consider to be in the Western Alliance, uh, if you actually look at Japan's long-term resilience as an economy within the Western Alliance is actually rather dubious. Uh, there are many, many characteristics of the way Japanese manage their economy that make it possible to imagine that they would be more easily integrated into a Chinese uh, structure than into the global structure of, of the West. Uh, and so uh, there's a very interesting book about this by Henry Pingleton uh, in which he signals that that uh, Japan's allegiance to the Western Alliance is, 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 is becoming increasingly unreliable. Um, as, the Chinese, as the Japanese prepare themselves for a situation where their economic future is going to be increasingly determined by Beijing and not by Washington or, or, or the European capitals. So, many uh, trends that we attributed to, uh, or that we hoped would be outcomes of liberal uh, internationalism, and, and the very notion that we, we believe that there's a continuous ascent of liberal democracy, um, all of this is increasingly refutable, not only in terms of actual trends that we observe, the mega trends that I mentioned, that, that Jack Goldson talked about, the political trends that, that I mentioned, uh, but also the weakening of the ideological hegemony of Western concepts uh, as it becomes uh, apparent to the West, I mean to the non-West, uh, that there are other answers out there. Now, a very uh, interesting bellwether is the recent uh, consequence, or the recent position that countries around the world have taken with regard to the Nobel Prize going to a dissident Chinese. Uh, of course, Beijing has strongly opposed this. But what's interesting is that if you look in the international media, many, many uh, international, uh, many countries that we thought of as middle-class countries have also condemned Norway uh, for intervening in China's policy. Uh, and they condemned Norway for a very clear reason. They said, how can you criticize China when it's the country that does more for its own working class than any other country in the world uh, by supporting this, you know, this guy who uh, fought the, the capitalist order of them. And so many of the developing countries have rallied around China in its condemnation of Norway. Uh, and then once again, this, this is surprising. Uh, we expected that the opposite would occur. And maybe in the long run, the opposite would occur. Maybe in the long run, China, uh, Chinese people would be mobilized by recognition that somebody in their country is this in this style with some international legitimacy. But the, the problem is that the majority of the Chinese population is going to see this as interference with Chinese sovereignty. So it goes back to the fact that this is only going to strengthen the axis of sovereignty. Uh, and, and what is at stake in the axis of sovereignty is the exception that it takes to one of the key principles of liberal internationalism, which is human rights, and the, and the notion of the right to protect. Uh, the right to protect uh, was was embodied in the Helsinki Accord, uh, and it was that, more than anything else, that changed, that created the optimism in 1992, when Gorbachev actually came and said that Russia was going to respect the international law uh, and basically was going to uh, lead in compliance with the Helsinki Accords. Now, the Chinese axis of sovereignty uh, take total exception to that, and they, they view the human rights agenda, particularly the Helsinki agenda, as the uh, as a violation 
traditional rights of sovereignty that, that are voted in the uh, Westphalian constitutional state. And, 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 and that is the that is the unifying uh, uh, ideology of, of the so-called axis of sovereignty, which now is more or less comprised of at least 50 countries uh, consistently, and as I say, is growing. So, um, how do we understand uh, the world uh, if, we, if, we, if we decide that, well, maybe liberal, liberal internationals have got it wrong, uh, and um, the interactive, interactive dynamics of system stability in a global, increasingly interdependent society that liberal international did not address, in my opinion, can best be addressed in the context of complexity theory. Uh, complexity theory is a the other part of this, this book is a different way to uh, to examine and understand uh, interactive uh, dynamics within social systems, both domestic social systems and international systems. Um, I'll just give you a few uh, a short uh, 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 preliminary uh, introduction to how the dynamics of social change are viewed differently in a complexity perspective. Uh, and then all of the questions. Uh, and if we if we look at uh, neoclassical models of, 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 of system behavior, whether they are in political science, IR, or in economics, of course I can only speak somewhat authoritatively about economics, uh, but I have noticed the same biases in international relations theory. So what you have are interactions among agents that are linear, that converge, to always a steady state equilibrium. If you have actors that are homogeneous, they are rational maximizers of expected utility, they exhibit stable rational expectations, the system is organized hierarchically, and the research strategies are deductive. And those people who, who, who succeed uh, at, at, at establishing their argument deductively are the ones who are given you know, great credence. Um, if we look at the uh, properties of complex systems, they're Basically adaptive to nonlinear networks in which outcomes depend on the anticipated action of a limited number of agents, the presence of other actors matter, and agents communicate. So this is fundamentally different from basically those of you who study game theory or other more traditional views. The system of order is immersion, it's derived from agent-based self-organization, uh, there's continual adaptation, reality is interpretive, cognitive. If processes are interactive at many levels, the agents base their actions on what other, on what they believe other agents will do. Uh, the actors themselves are heterogeneous. Uh, their actions are irreversible. In other words, history matters. You have what some people call F tendency uh, uh, dynamics. There's no global controller or global optimum. Now, this is actually a, a more critical perspective of where we're talking about, because liberal internationalism presumes a view of evolution in which there's a global optimum to which all countries will converge, uh, and, and using the sciences of complexities, because the sciences of complexities are in many different sciences, uh, we see that no global optimum exists. And this is uh, extremely uh, significant in terms of what uh, international policy experts do, which is basically to provide optimal solutions, and the optimal solutions have been uh, solutions that of, of democratic accountability, of market competition, uh, and and uh, the relevance of these, I mean, the, what drives these, the, 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 all of this is the belief that uh, countries are evolving in a linear pattern towards a global optimum, but from a complexity point of view, the interactive dynamics are co-evolutionary, uh, and, and it's mostly local fitness genes that determine the behavior of actors, not global uh, fitness genes. So uh, this this is this is very consequential when you're doing uh, the, the, the analysis. Uh, so you have component entities that are frequently part of more than one higher level activity, uh, and that also is a, a very challenging way to look at social change. So there's no linear focal point by which all actors aspire, 
change occurs at multiple levels or people in evolutionary science call uh, scales and research strategies strategies are end up and not end up. So using this framework I have tried to reconstruct what I think are the current interactive dynamics of the uh, global system uh, and um, so I'd like to entertain your questions and comments and thoughts.